All right, if you take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. As you're turning there, you'll notice it's uh, a short chapter, and it's the last chapter. So we're coming to an end of our study in 2 Corinthians. And um, as usual, I always kind of fall really in love with these chapters, these books as we're going through, and I'm always disappointed to see the end. You may not share that concept. I don't know, but I do. Um, but we are coming to the end of this, and so we're going to be breaking this up into a couple sections still. But 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 4. Back in 1901, Teddy Roosevelt actually made popular a phrase that you've probably heard before, even if you didn't necessarily know which president happened to mention it or say it. But he popularized the African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. Now that last part, you will go far, usually gets cut off when we're usually referring to that or thinking about that or using that. And so we just speak softly and carry a big stick. And that was just kind of a way that Teddy Roosevelt felt about and described his foreign policy. He wanted to speak softly. He wasn't big on just making a lot of noise, causing a lot of you know, talking points and all this kind of stuff, and then never doing anything with it. He would just simply speak softly and then he had a stick, which for him happened to be the Great White Fleet, America's naval power that was circumnavigating the globe at the time, demonstrating our ability uh, that really nobody could touch in that time frame, in that moment. That was his big stick. That was what he did to be able to kind of do, uh, demonstrate his power, his ability to act if the need should so arise. And politics aside, Paul is kind of describing for us, he's been speaking softly, more or less, but today he's revealing to us that he also carries a very big stick. And that might seem surprising to us because Paul's not really been messing around with the Corinthians this whole entire time. But if the Corinthians are not willing to listen, and there's, it's not the whole church, it's just a contingent within the church really at this point. But if they're not willing to listen, then he's prepared to use his stick. He's prepared to swing it. And so we're talking about this, and, and we're thinking about this, and this is kind of church discipline, but it's really... Beyond that, it's broader than that, and it's important that they realize he's not afraid to use it because they've been refusing his counsel. He speaks on behalf of God. And the same way that many prophets would speak on behalf of God, and when they came up with people that refused to listen, they would go above and beyond. They would demonstrate their power. They would demonstrate that they could speak for God. They would do some things, sometimes, that, sometimes miraculous, sometimes devastating. And they would do things to demonstrate, I really do speak for God. You need to listen. It feels like Paul is actually venturing into that category as he's moving forward. But it's a warning. It's a warning so that they will heed the warning and change, and it never has to happen. And it's a warning to them. It's a warning to us. All of these things, they're warnings to us. They're warning us, this is coming. Peril is coming. Danger is coming. Do something. Change course. Do something. Alter. Don't, don't just continue blindly going in this direction and just thinking... It'll be fine. It's not. But the purpose of a warning is actually to demonstrate a supreme love. For Paul, it's a supreme love of God. He's, he's faithful. He's, he's jealous over God's fame and who God is. He wants to magnify and make much of God. He absolutely does. So there is a love that Paul has for God that makes him and prompts him to say these things and do these things. But there's also a love that he has for the Corinthian people that he says, I don't want you to suffer needlessly because you're going in a direction that is going to be devastating to you. And I don't want you to go there. I really do mean and want what's best for you. He does truly love them. It may not feel like it, but this really is one of the most loving things he could possibly do for them. To be simply indifferent. To just look at them and say, whatever, I don't care anymore. That would really be to hate them. He doesn't hate them. He loves them. He wants what's best for them. And so he warns them. But the reality is that you cannot flippantly ignore the word of God and assume that God's just not going to do anything. That he's just going to sit there and allow things to go idly by. This is a love of God towards the Corinthian people. And it is a love that we sometimes describe as a tough love. You probably use this on your kids from time to time. It's like, I, it's a tough love, but I, I want you to change. I don't want you to go through life looking like this and doing this and thinking like this. It's a tough love that you have to take things away or you have to discipline, you have to punish, you have to do things, but you want them to learn because you're trying to spare them from something. 
and Paul is trying to do that too. God is trying to do that, warn them. Now, God can use church discipline. He often does. He can also just use other things outside of that, like bad things, suffering, trials, things that come into our lives. Sometimes, not always, we are not Job's three friends. Sometimes, things really do happen in life because God is bringing things into our lives to get our, our attention. To wake us up from our slumber, to keep us from falling asleep and just continuing going in a direction that's actually harmful for us. And either we don't realize it or we don't care. And God says, I'm going to bring something in your life to get you, that gets your attention. I want you to see something. I want you to hear something. You're not listening. You're not seeing. You're not getting. No, is that every time? No. I cannot emphasize that enough. No, it's not every time. Sometimes hard things come into our lives because hard things come into our lives. God's doing something in us and through us with that that's positive. He's building us. But it's not because we did something. It's not a punishment. But sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. The goal of God's earthly discipline is to spare you from eternal discipline, judgment. That is the goal. That's the goal that Paul has in here as he's addressing these Corinthians, really a small contingent of the larger group of Corinthians. But that is his goal. He wants to spare them. And he really does mean that when he says spare them. It's not going to be well received, but it's necessary. Let's just read verses 1 through 4 this morning. I'm going to keep them together. We'll kind of reference them off and on as we go through. But here's what we see. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warn those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. What we're looking at here, first and foremost, is the proper procedure. What is the proper procedure? Paul is more or less bringing charges, so to speak, uh, uh, accusations, accusing the Corinthians. There's a way in which this has to happen. What is the proper procedure? And first, right away in verse 1, we see... Paul, this is going to be the third time that he'll be coming to them. It's really probably about 80, 50 when Paul came and he planted the church. He came into Corinth and he planted this church really from scratch. And this is a really big deal. I think, again, I've mentioned it time and time again, but it's, I, I don't think, think we always appreciate the fact that like, planting a church in Corinth was more or less like planting a church in Las Vegas or in New York City. It's a, it's a tough place to do that. They're both very transient. They're both very wealthy. There's both people that are, that are looking to get into trouble. They're looking to do things. They're, they've got some idle time. And there's opportunities everywhere for both positive and, and negative aspects. And you can imagine what people will choose more often than not. For as messed up as the Corinthians are in this passage, we know they had, there's probably more problems mentioned in the book of, of First and Second Corinthians than anywhere else in Scripture about problems and difficulties the church is having. We do, at some level, have to cut them a break to a point. Not that we excuse sin, but just think about it. Think about being in our modern context, being a Christian in New York City. Or think about being a believer in Las Vegas. How hard is that? When you are surrounded by depravity that is elevated and praised and, and, and people are flocking to you because they want to do that. And that's where you happen to live. Can you imagine how hard it would be to really live out your Christian faith in, in a public manner, in a meaningful manner, in that kind of a context because that's where you just so happen to live. And that's where you are. And maybe you can't get out. Or maybe you think, I, these people need Jesus too. Maybe we're staying here because we're living and we're missionally living. And we're only five years in as we're looking at 2 Corinthians. This is a young church. It's a, very, it's a very difficult church. But understand the context in which they're in. It is truly a testament to God's grace and faithfulness that the church in Corinth even exists. But that was Paul's first visit. But it's certainly a hard place to be a, hard place to be a Christian in. And then there was the second time when he was there. It was the painful visit. It was a short visit. They were having problems. They were having issues. So Paul goes and he visits with them and he starts probably rebuking them and, and uh, challenging them in a lot of things. And it feels like, we don't know a lot of details, but it doesn't sound like it was going very well. And we're not sure if they just kind of threw him out or he was just like, I got to go before I say something or do something that I'm going to look back on and regret. 
And so it's short, and he leaves. He leaves. And that prompted then the painful letter that had a profound effect on this church, that changed them to the core, that has really brought them back from the brink to what we find going on here in 2 Corinthians, where they've come a long way. There's still a group that's maybe holdouts, but for the vast majority, they're, they're in a much better place than they were. Truly amazing, they respond. I wish we had that letter. I would love to read that part. Like, what was going on? What did you say? It doesn't exist. We don't have it. And then there's this that he's mentioning here. This is the third time. It's a future visit that Paul is just kind of warning him about. I'm coming. The reason, though, that Paul seems to mention this third visit or the fact that he's coming, and it happens to be the third visit, is strange because you look at this. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. You're like, wait, it doesn't flow very well. And really, as I looked at this, I thought, okay, third time through visit, two or three witnesses, the three, third and three, does that correlate somehow? And lo and behold, that's actually what a lot of people think Paul is doing. He's using it as a segue to get to the other thing. So my third visit happens to coincide with needing two or three witnesses to have a course. Now, some people love that idea. Some people absolutely despise that idea, thinking that's what Paul was trying to do here. I happen to like it. You don't have to. But it actually is an ancient understanding of this text and what Paul is trying to do here. So the Paul's three visits with the Corinthians will correlate to the three witnesses that were needed in some kind of a trial. Now, if you don't like that idea, there are options out there. There are people that think, well, Paul's three warnings are actually the uh, witnesses that he's using against them. So he mentioned something back in 1 Corinthians. There's the painful letter. There's something in 2 Corinthians too. Those are the three warnings that Paul issued. That makes sense. I don't know if that's really what he's doing, but it makes sense. Other people think that it's maybe actually honest-to-goodness witnesses. So that you have Timothy, there's Titus, and he's calling on God himself as witness over the things that have been going on in this Corinthian church. That's possible, too. That is possible, too. You can choose. I do think, though, that Paul is looking at his three visits and these three witnesses as the same. That's what he's referring to. But whatever they happen to be, he's basing it on Deuteronomy 19.15 as part of the law. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in, any, in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses shall a charge be established. And that's actually a really good practice. In fact, um, it's kind of a rule of thumb that Pam and I have used as we've been trying to raise our kids, certainly not perfectly, and I didn't come up with it. I think somebody kind of hinted at this. Um, we kind of adopted it. But when our kids, and we're suspicious of them lying to us, and for whatever it happens to be, we... we we try to be very, very careful and slow before we do anything. We, we want to be sure that we know, that, in fact, that they're lying. We want to be able to prove that. That could be as simple as they admit it. That's an easy one. Or there's witnesses or there's obvious evidence that can be used against them to, you know, like, okay, you've done this. You, you're guilty of this. But if we're not sure, if we're not sure on whether or not they're lying, we don't do anything. We believe them. Sometimes that's actually hard. It's actually a very hard thing to do. And it's not to pat ourselves on the back. It's because, one, I th like I said, I think someone mentioned that to us when we were kind of going through our early married classes or something like that. But I can specifically remember, I wish I remembered the events, but I do remember a time when I was a kid and I got in trouble for something and I was so frustrated and so upset with my parents because they didn't believe me and I got in trouble for something. I'm like, I'm not lying. I really wasn't. I really wasn't, and I got in trouble anyway, and I thought, what's the point of telling the truth if I'm just going to get in trouble anyway? It was infuriating. It was frustrating, and I was, I was young. I was uh, like early, early elementary, and I just remember being so frustrated with it. Like, I told the truth, it's, and I don't remember, I don't think it was like a, a, like, I think something like accidentally happened or like it was an intention kind of a thing. It was really hard to prove one way or the other, but they didn't believe me, and I was so frustrated. I was so upset with that. What I certainly didn't understand then, and only really coming to grips with now, is that the law, God's law, actually prefers to allow a guilty person to go free, unpunished, because there's not enough witnesses against them, to, than to harm an innocent person with reckless charges. Let that settle in for a minute. It prefers to allow the guilty to go free rather than falsely accuse and punish an innocent person. The protection of the innocent is more important in the eyes of God than the punishment of the guilty. 
when there are questions. That's truly remarkable. You know, how many of you have ever gotten one of those wrong where you, you, you maybe you get it wrong and uh, you, know, you punch one of your kids and it becomes clear later on and you say, well, that just makes up for one of those times you got away with beforehand and like, so God, you know, we'll, we'll get you on the roundabout way, right? It's made up for. Anybody, be honest, seriously. Have you not done this? Okay. Thank you, George. And seriously, you are all liars. I'm just... <laughs> I know you've done it. You've done it. You're like, oh, well, that makes up for the time I missed or I forgot or whatever. It's a classic parent thing. Do you know that like, God does not know that answer? He does not know that answer. That's not an answer that God uses. He would rather let the guilty go free than to punish the innocent. Why? Why? I think there's some logical answers for that. One is the fact that the guilty might realize, like, I got away with one there, but that was close. I don't want to be there again. Sometimes, not always, sometimes they'll change. And that's ultimately the goal of punishment anyway. They, they will change. The other thing is then, what about the innocent that is harmed in that process? What about them? They did the right thing and got in trouble anyway. How bitter might they get? How incensed might they be? Right? Now, is that going to be frustrating for people? Especially when somebody's like, okay, the guilty got away with something. Is that going to be frustrating for you? Absolutely. It is going to be absolutely frustrating. But when someone who's truly innocent gets in prison for a crime they didn't commit, maybe even more so. Paul has three witnesses. It satisfies the law, whether, regardless of what they happen to be, whether it's his visits or actual witnesses or his warnings or whatever. He has three items, three witnesses he's calling them to use against the Corinthians to determine how he proceeds further. So these charges, whatever they happen to be, are well established as he's moving forward and enough to convict. But what is he after? There is a goal in this discipline, in this venture that he's on, and that's what we need to consider here. It's the proper goal. What is the proper goal? Proper procedure is important. We're following that. What's the proper goal of this when it comes to, we'll call it church discipline, it's broader than that, but it's this. And you might miss this at first, but what are warnings actually for? What are warnings actually for? They're opportunities to change. The opportunities to prevent. The minority in this church in Corinth has been warned several times to change. He's warned them in person. He's warned them in letter. He's warned them with his, uh, his friends, Timothy and Titus and others that have been and visited with the church. He's warned them over and over and over again. He's warned them. I failed to listen. I says, I will not spare you. But he actually wants to. The goal of any church discipline is and should always be one of restoration. To see people back. To see people back in fellowship, of course, with the church, but really with God. You know, going under church system or something, some of them, it's a sign to them, it's a sign to you that it's like something's broken, something's not right. The church recognizes that now. Can the church get it wrong? You bet. Of course they can. But it should still make you sit back and think, wait a minute, okay, the church is looking at me, my behavior, my direction, things are going on in my life, and they're saying, we're concerned about you, we're worried about you, that you're going in a direction that says something about you that nobody wants to be said about them. It's a warning. Heed the warning. Look at this. Think about this. Why? Because it's a matter of eternal consequence. It's not trivial. And in fact, when it comes to the Corinthians, Paul has exercised this kind of severe discipline with them in the past. 1 Corinthians 5, or, yeah, 5 dictates a, a moment, a situation in which a sin was going on in that place that was so egregious. He doesn't even follow the Matthew 18 principle of, you know, talking to the person, going back with two or three, then kind of disclosing it to the church, and then removing them from fellowship, the normal four-step process. He doesn't even do that. He says, they got to go. Right now, right here, they got to go. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. You are delivered, this man, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Why? See, we, we look at this for sometimes we think, okay, he's handed over Satan. That's not a good thing. He's removed from the fellowship. That's not a good thing. But look at the reason. It's baked right into the verse. Why does he do this? The last phrase, so that his spirit, I would say his soul, may be saved in the day of the Lord, that he might be spared. That's what he wants. He wants him to be spared. And it's very possible we see that in this very person, we're, we're guessing a little bit here, but it makes sense, that we're seeing this very person, that it worked. 
that it works. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We'll read all the verses, but it feels like that's the same person. And it's worked. He's, he's repented. He's confessed. He's like, bring him back in. And they were slow for whatever reason to do that. But look, look here. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he's caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we should, would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Assuming it's the same guide, and like I said, it is an assumption, but we say it worked. It worked. He's been brought back into fellowship with the church. Does that happen every time? No. Not always. It does, though, sometimes. And I would argue that I don't think church discipline is actually complete until a person is back in the fold, back in the church, has been restored. I, I think that's true. I think there's always that hope that you hold out and say, like, this person might come back. Things can change in this person's life. The goal of church discipline is not to simply remove someone from the fellowship of the church. It's to restore them to God. It's not about just throwing people out. It's not it at all. It's to bring them back. But it's because he was not spared that he's ultimately spared. He felt the rod, but it called him back. Paul actually loved this guy. He actually loved him. He wanted to warn him, and he didn't want him to just continue going on in this direction that was actually devastating and says something about him that nobody wants to be said about them. But Paul was also very civil in the handling of this, and so should we all be in this anytime we approach it. There are procedures that need to be followed. As I said, Teddy Roosevelt, with his stick, it wasn't simply that he had the great white fleet, and if you don't do what I want to do, then guess what? This is what you get. It wasn't that at all. In fact, he was very particular. He treated, actually, the nations around him, from what I understand, uh, with, with, he wanted to act justly with them. He treated them with respect. He interacted with them well. And if and when the time came where he needed to act, from what I've read, the, the reality is that he always allowed them to save face with him. So in other words, there was a desire for restoration. There was a desire to come back together again. It wasn't a time in which he could, I'm going to humiliate you, and you no longer have a seat at the table. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to remove your name. I'm going to blow up the table like in your area so you can never come back here. You're never going to be well. He didn't do any of that stuff. It seems like there was a time in which they would relent, they would change course, and say, all right, welcome back. Nice to have you. Let's forget that ever happened and move forward. That's what he wanted. That was the goal. It was restoration. It was, it was a chance, an opportunity to move forward. He didn't want to humiliate anyone, but he was not fooling around. He was willing to act when necessary. What kind of things is Paul wanting to spare them from? It might actually surprise you. Because church discipline, just the removing from fellowship, was really just the tip of the iceberg. 1 Corinthians 5, of course, details handing someone over to Satan. That's not good. But for whatever reason, that was what was necessary in that time. But there are, interestingly enough, other moments of judgment in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, that might surprise you. They might not necessarily correlate together, but they're actually kind of fascinating. Uh, I think it was James mentioned Ananias and Sapphira in Sunday school, but that is a great example of that. They come in, they sell a piece of property, they pretend to have given the entire amount to the church, and then Peter interacts with them and says, hey, you're going to lie to the Spirit? And he says, you lied, you died. And then the wife comes in, hey, have you seen my husband? Well, maybe, you know, and he review, reviews the thing again. He goes, all right, you lied, you died, and they carry her out. That's it. But that is, that is, there's a finality to that. Of what's going on in there, like you violated what the church is supposed to be, what, what's supposed to be going on in here. And you, they pay really the ultimate price. There's another one that Paul actually involved with. I'm not real familiar with this story. And it's very brief and short, but it's interesting. Um, it reminds me, it makes me wonder if this didn't inspire that scene in The Lord of the Rings where Wormwood is kind of speaking into the, the, the ear of the king, and he's kind of like all, you know, the movie anyway, all grayed out and kind of like a, a bumbling fool, but he's under the control of Wormwood. I, I, I feel like this might be inspired by this passage here. Maybe not. 
But a man by the name of Limus, who's an, a magician, in interfering with Sergius Paulus and hearing the gospel that Paul was bringing, he's interested in, and he's whispering in his ear, trying to turn him away from the gospel. Acts 13. And here's Paul's interaction with this man. He says, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went around seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I mean, that's a pretty powerful thing. Right then and there. Would we categorize that as typical church discipline? No, the man's not even a believer. He's not even part of the church. But Paul, right then and there, was able to call down judgment on him and says, you will not mess with the gospel. You will not interfere with this man coming to know Christ as his Savior. Blind. But that's not the only thing. And, and we specifically can get to 1 Corinthians 11. We use that all the time as we do communion. We usually do a very abbreviated moment of that, but we sometimes forget what comes after that. Is he's trying to correct their egregious violation of the communion, the love feast as it was usually known or called to. And there's a group of people in that group that they're, they're taking advantage of that. They're eating and drinking because there's damnation of themselves. Why? Because they're, like, they're practicing like gluttony. They're eating and they're drinking everything for themselves. They're excluding other people. This feast is supposed to demonstrate a love for the brethren, a coming together of what we have in common. And these people are going home starving and you're stuffing your face. What is the matter with you? And then he tells them, some of you are weak and some of you are sick and some of you have died. They don't even know. Let's look. Verse, verse 27. Verse Corinthians 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Oops. So we see that going on here. And that's just for drinking, eating and drinking improperly. No murder, no theft, no rape, no adultery, none of those things that we would think would be, would be caused for those kinds of actions. They're simply eating and drinking unworthily. They're marring the picture that communion, keeping the Lord's Supper, is supposed to communicate. And he says, some of you have died because of that. Just for eating and drinking poorly, wrongly. How much more for perverting the gospel itself, Corinthians. And you think, Jeff, you're, 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 you're embellishing here. You're exaggerating here a little bit. The very next, Lord willing, next week we'll see this first. Verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this is about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. That is very similar language to what we find in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul's not messing around when he's talking about walking around with a big stick. Just because you're not keeping this meal well. He really is trying to spare them. The same way Jesus sought to spare us all. You know, Jesus often spoke softly. He was capable of more. In fact, he did do more. There was the time when he goes into the temple and starts overturning the tables of the money changers and takes out the whip and starts smacking them and doing all that kind of stuff. Like He was capable of those kinds of things. He was, he was capable of intensity and in anger. But more often than not, that's not what characterized Jesus. He was quiet and calm and soft. And more often than not, when people, the crowds got agitated or things got kind of heated, he just simply left. He spoke softly, demonstrating a grace and a patience that's truly remarkable. And yet we also find Jesus carrying a stick, or at least trying to. He drug it through the streets of Jerusalem. He drug it through the countryside. He drug it up the little hill called Golgotha. But then he used it on himself. Why? Because he wanted to spare you. Jesus was the way that God spoke softly to all of us. Hebrews 11, 1, or excuse me, 1, 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. 
You see, and this picture behind me is from a video called Full of Eyes, just a representation of some of the things that are going on here. But we realize that when God speaks and God has, he doesn't carry a stick, he carries a sword. A sword of judgment. A sword that fell first on his son so that it wouldn't fall on you. Justice has to be carried out or it's going to be injustice. There's no two ways about it. It had to be carried out. Justice has to fall. And it fell, though, here on his own son in order to spare you. Jesus comes and he warns you, but he warns you that justice and judgment is coming. But the only way to really spare you was to take it upon himself. And he did. On a cross. Really a cross that was meant for you. Well, how can I have this? It's as simple as asking for it. Right? It really is as simple. In fact, that's, that's really all it is. You can't earn this. It's something that's too expensive. It's, it's the cost. You could never pay the cost. You could never satisfy the demand. And so rather than try to cheapen it, he simply says you can just have it. Not because it's cheap, but it's because it's the only way you could ever embrace it. It's too expensive. So Christ came that you might be spared, but he's giving you a warning. Heed the warning or suffer the consequences. That's what it's designed to do. The question always becomes, won't you come? If you are outside of Christ, if you are still trying to either earn this on your own, or you think that you're good enough as it is, like stop trying to earn what God simply wants to give to you. But you have to come to a place, an end of yourself, where you acknowledge, yes, what God is saying about me is true. I am a sinner condemned to die for my sinful nature and for what I have done. You have to acknowledge that. You have to admit that you are in need. But there's also a point in which you come in and you admit, like, and I can do nothing about it. I can't earn this. I can't work for this. I can't accomplish this. If Jesus doesn't do this for me, I'm, I'm done. And you go to him and says, yes, Lord, put my sins on Jesus' account. It's a, it's, a, it's a free gift. It's a free gift for each and every one of us. He says, here, come. You can have this. But it's amazing to me how many people are like, no, I'll pass. I'd rather work for it myself. Then you'll never get there. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough energy. You don't have enough ability to actually do this on your own. It's impossible. You have to understand that it's impossible. Jesus is the only way. The only way to the Father is through Christ. He's told us this all throughout Scripture. He's the only way. And yet he says, here, I've done it. Won't you come? Won't you come? God's free gift must be accepted. Proper procedure. Proper goal. But then there's also a proper power. Real power behind all of this. This is not something that you or anyone else can shield themselves from. There is power behind this. We find that in the last two verses, really. What is the proper power Paul, do you really speak for Jesus? That's really what verse 3 is asking here. Great, um, as, he's, as he's asking this, you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, like you don't believe me. And Paul's honestly is like, you know what, I'm so sick of this question. I'm so sick of you guys. I, I'm not even going to answer you anymore. I'm just going to start swinging, and you tell me. I'm going to swing the stick that God has put in my hand, and you tell me who's, who's got whose power. God is dealing with you through me so Powerfully, And Paul's argument seems to be, as he continues into verse 4 there, something like this, that Jesus looked pretty weak. And certainly hanging on a cross, he looked pretty weak. In fact, that was the, one of the accusations that the Pharisees and others were making towards him. Look, there, you've nailed yourself, to, you're, you've been nailed to the cross, you healed others, and now you yourself cannot do anything of yourself. You look weak, you look so pathetic. Why don't you get down for yourself and call somebody, call one of God's angels to come get you down? Silence. There's a lot of ways to die. That was the worst of them. It was humiliating. It was we, You're literally nailed up there, typically naked. The Jews usually gave some kind of dignity because the, you know, the Bible eschews uh, nakedness so much. You probably have some kind of a loincloth, some kind, something draped across them a little bit, some just minuscule amount of dignity. But it was shameful. It was humiliating. It was the definition, the quintessential demonstration of weakness. And there he is. You claim to be God. 
and that you're, there you hang. You would do anything to avoid this. And yet he's vindicated by God because he lives by God's power. And Paul seems to be saying, look, I know I look weak. You've told me many times. You tell me I can't speak very well. You tell me that I'm an embarrassment to your craft, that if I was really good at this, that I would have to work over here making tents to support myself, that I would be just like one of you guys, being able to speak and make a living off the words coming out of my mouth. All through chapter 11, we talked to Paul, goes through all the terrible things that happened to him, the shipwrecks and the, and the starvations and the cold and the, and the imprisonments and all the things that happened to me. You've told me over and over again how weak I really am. We've established that. Paul looks weak. And yet God was manifesting his power in Paul through all those terrible things that were happening to him. Because when I am weak, then he is strong. And you should be afraid because I'm coming. You know who else is coming? Christ. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. And that is not a time for celebration if Christ comes simply as king. It's not. We need a bloody savior. We must have a bloody Savior, someone who lays down his life for us, or simply we are saying, the king is coming and judgment is falling. But judgment already fell on a bloody Savior. Our sin has already been paid for on a bloody Savior. And so when we talk about Christ coming again, one, there's a warning to spare those who are outside of Christ. That needs to be heeded. But there's also rejoicing that those whose sin has been atoned for, paid for, because it's already been put on the shoulders of Christ, there is something that we can truly rejoice over because my sins are paid for. I'm free from sin. Free from guilt. I have no fear. So when I see Jesus coming back in the, in, the, in the clouds in the sky, I don't see a, king, a, a, a Savior with a crown on his head and a sword in his hand, and I fear. I see a bloody Savior coming back for his own. Because the justice in God's hand fell on him for me already. Paul, when he comes to the Corinthians, is going to bring the pain. Not because he can, but because he loves. Jesus, God, sometimes brings things into our lives, not because he simply can, though he can, he's able, but because he loves. And he loves you too much to allow you to just keep going in the direction that you are going unchecked. He wants to stop you in your tracks. It's like, no, don't go over that way. That way is death. Only death. There is no life over there. You need a U-turn. Because life is over here. Well, you turn. Church discipline is designed to do that when done well. God's discipline is designed to do that. It's always done well. To wake people up out of their slumber. To show them. Jesus, their need for Christ, the, re the reality that they're going in the wrong direction, the wrong, uh, the wrong things, they're, they're pursuing those. It's a discipline. It is a discipline. But the goal of that is to save them and to spare them from an eternal discipline and judgment. That's what Paul's saying here. He loves them too much to not say anything. God loves us too much to not say anything. But it should make us all stop and think to really understand that God really does love us. He loves us enough to show us tough love. It means to give us an opportunity to repent and to change. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for this day that you have given to us. We're thankful for this passage that you've provided that we can look and see what is going on, what has taken place here in the lives of the Corinthians. And we don't know all the ins and outs, every nuance of what was going on there. But Lord, we don't have to. We've seen bits and pieces in our own lives of times in which we held on to sin just a little bit too tightly. We wanted to ignore your word. We wanted to do our own thing. 
And Lord, because of your love, you wouldn't let us. Sometimes you bring a person into our lives. Sometimes you bring a church into our lives. Sometimes you just bring suffering into our lives. To spare us from the direction that we are pursuing hard after. It's never fun, but it's necessary. And so we thank you for that. We might learn those lessons. But Lord, for the rest of us, or really all of us, I suppose, a demonstration of a love for us that you have and sending your son that the sword might fall on him and spare us. Lord, we have your word in our hands that we might be spared. We have heralds of the gospel so that we might be spared. Lord, even this morning in Sunday school, someone mentioned a, uh, an individual on the other side of the world simply trying to hand out the Bible, spread the gospel in a Muslim context, and was terribly beaten. And yet, Lord, he wants to glorify you. And he wants to see his fellow Muslim brothers lay down their adherence to Islam and be spared from the final judgment that is coming if they remain as they are. And he's willing to have and to see his body beaten and broken. That those people, his, his comrades might know the truth of the word of God and might be spared. And he's beaten for his trouble. And yet he gladly gets up rejoicing and plans to do it again. What love, what love he has for his people. What love we ought to have for our fellow people. What love you have for us. That we might be spared. And Lord, there are people in this room this morning that do not know you as their savior. May they hear this message today and take it to heart that they might be spared. The horrors of hell. That they might be spared the good American life that we all honestly all want. We might be spared from that which keeps us from knowing and finding you. That we might be spared an eternity away from you. Lord, it's all grace. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it with us. In Christ's name, amen.